enjoyed our uh, worship and song this morning. I uh, looked out at uh, uh, all of our leaders and they're all smiling and, and that brought a smile to my face. Uh, a lot of times you'd be surprised uh, when you're leading a congregation in song to see their facial expressions because they're not always all that great. <laughs> Uh, and to see our leaders rejoicing is a blessing to me. Uh, Brother Tony, uh, a request from your pastor. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the Revelation song, and since we're in Revelation, uh, maybe we could make that the song just before uh, worship hour uh, until we finish Revelation. It's just a request. If you don't do it, it's okay. <laughs> but I will remember. No. <laughs> uh, payday someday. <laughs> uh, when I was in seminary, I, um, there was a sermon. Now, this is when cassettes were still available. You know, that's way back in the ancient days. Uh, but uh, uh, going around uh, the seminary, uh, was this sermon and uh, on cassette and everybody was telling me you gotta listen to this sermon it's payday Sunday uh, and uh, can't even remember uh, the preacher who preached it uh, but uh, I finally got a hold of the cassette and uh, on my way home I was uh, listening to it uh, in the car and uh, uh, this uh, uh, a preacher got up and introduced his text in, in, in a very slow, uh, methodic, monotone, deep voice, rather boring. You know, the, the sermon is entitled This Morning Payday Sunday. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be this is going to be an ordeal just driving home listening to this. And uh, he read the text in the same monotone voice and uh, prayed in the same monotone prayer. Uh, and then he got into the sermon uh, and it was entitled Payday Someday. And he kept jacking it up. And by the end of the sermon, this preacher is saying, Payday Sunday! And your hair just stood up on your arms, you know? Uh, and uh, never forgot that sermon. <laughs> Payday someday. So, payday someday. Okay, amen. Sweet people, oh come let us adore him. This is part three. We're in chapter number five. And our text is, I saw a great angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break the seals thereof? Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this privilege of worship, this privilege of praise, this privilege to just share with you our burdens and prayer for the privilege of just listening to this angel's question and this verse of scripture and realizing that it's only because of your son. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Read with me now chapter number five uh, to yourselves. And when you get done, just glance up at me and uh, we'll continue. Revelation chapter number five in its entirety.
Okay, let's begin. Great chapter. Uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, and throughout our study course here in Revelation, uh, your pastor is going to find it um, increasingly difficult uh, to cover everything uh, in every chapter. Uh, and uh, I even struggle here in chapter number five, um, even though we'll consider the verses, um, uh, my heart is to go much deeper uh, and we just don't have the time frame uh, to do that. But let's begin nonetheless and we're gonna see uh, a great answer to the angel's question. This morning we see the only one who is worthy of opening up this seven sealed scroll. And of course his name is Jesus and he alone is worthy of our praise. The book of Revelation is a book filled with his praise once again, our attention is drawn to his worship in this chapter where our focus shifts from the throne to the seven sealed book in God's hand. Verse number one, and I saw on, in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. The one here that is sitting on the throne is our heavenly father. And in his right hand is a letter, a book written within and on the back side. It's interesting when God decrees something uh, in his word, uh, he doesn't leave any room uh, to change. This is a legal document that um, John is seeing in the Father's hand. And there's no room for changes because it's written on each side of the page. God doesn't have to make any uh, changes because there's no plan B with God. It's complete in its entirety here. It is a rolled up deed with words on both sides, front and back. Sealed with seven seals. In John's day, historically, uh, in Rome, uh, legal documents, important documents, uh, would be rolled up in a vellum scroll, uh, and it would be sealed with uh, uh, those in importance uh, that would declare this document uh, to be true. And a lot of times uh, kings would seal uh, their royal documents. And here we see seven seals. And the only person that has the right to open the royal seal was one to whom the document was addressed. Verse number two. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Strong angel. Kind of interesting. I, I kind of consider all the angelic host uh, being strong, uh, but here is a specified angel of great might, proclaiming with a loud voice. In the Greek, it's a mega voice. It's an angel shouting. Who is worthy to open the book? and loose the seals thereof. By now we can all determine the answer to the angel's question. Of course it is Christ. Verse number three, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, the scroll, neither to look thereon. I think there's an uh, intriguing phrase here we kind of get no man in heaven and no man in earth, but what are we talking about of those that are under uh, the earth? 
Those under the earth refer to all of the great saints whose bodies rest awaiting their great awakening day. To be absent of body is to be present with the Lord. But our bodies don't immediately transport to heaven. They go back to the dust. They rest there under the earth until we receive a glorified body one day to go along with our glorified mind and our glorified spirit. Amen. No one here in heaven or earth could be found who had the right to break the seals and open up this holy document from the Father's hand. The scroll represents Christ's title deed to all that the Father has promised to his Son. When you go back into the book of Genesis, it's interesting you're studying the book of Revelation and how many times you go back uh, to the book of Genesis uh, for reference material. Really interesting. Uh, but here in the garden, we see God giving everything to Adam. He was to look over and care for it all. It was his. And then Satan came. And through his deception and sinfulness, he rests that from Adam's hand. And now all of creation isn't in Christ control yet, but it will be. You see, Satan is the God of this world right now. And this world is crying out in travail. This world is dying, Paul declared. But one day, Jesus will come back to claim that which is his. And that's what we see in this seven sealed scroll. It's a heavenly, holy document that the Father has decreed everything in his universe and creation to his son. Love it. But initially, when confronted with the angel's question, John cried, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. No one in heaven or earth could be found who had the right to break open the seals of this royal document from the Father's hand. This scroll represents Christ's title deed to all that has been promised to him. In Psalms 2.8, we read these words as the father speaks this to his son, ask of me and I shall give the heathen all peoples for thine inheritance and in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Psalms 2.8, isn't that a great verse of scripture? The father's just saying, son, ask me, it's all yours. It all belongs to Christ. It is his right by creation. Our Lord, as the creator spoke and creation came into being, and we see this in the book of Isaiah. So it all belongs to Christ by right of creation. It all belongs to Christ by right of redemption. He is our kinsman redeemer. God became man so that we might be purchased of him. 
And we see this, of course, in the book of Ruth. And lastly, all things are Christ by right of inheritance. He is the appointed heir of all things. We find that in Hebrews, the first chapter, and verse number two, and numerous other verses. Let's continue now in verse number five. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Because God bless your heart, Christ is God's son, is forever able. We looked at the elders last week and the picture of the priesthood, and we described that. No one in God's universe can be found worthy to open the seals other than God the Son, as the elder proclaims. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. If you want to see who's able to break the seals and open up the book, the lion of the tribe of Judah can, title of Jesus Christ, the root of David, title of Christ, he can. The lion of Judah and the one who comes from the root of David hath prevailed. He can. The word prevailed means the one who is victorious. Isn't that great? Jesus is the one who is victorious. He's the answer to every one of the overcoming promises given to his churches in chapters 2 and 3. He is the one who has overcome sin, death, and hell for us. He is the one who is triumphant over all evil. He is the one who is sovereign over all. He is the only one who is able to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Remember the number seven speaks of fulfillment, completion, and perfection in biblical numerology. Therefore, these seven seals represent the entire fulfillment of God's plan as viewed in Christ. It's all coming to fruition. The seven seals then picture the entire completion of God's purpose in Revelation. The seven seals contain the entire perfect will of God as seen in his Son. How can you not love this as we consider the one who is almighty? He's our almighty king. What we're seeing in these verses is when our Lord takes the title, the deed of that which is his, because it's all his. In studying the book of Revelation, rarely is it necessary to speculate about the book's imagery because most every scriptural type and spiritual symbol given us there will be explained somewhere else in the Bible. So we get all these wonderful glimpses of the spiritual and scriptural metaphors that we see in Revelation, we see glimpses of them elsewhere. As we learn to compare scripture with scripture, as Isaiah declares, and what we find in this seven sealed scroll, we're given a great glimpse of it through the life of the prophet Jeremiah. And I think that's really interesting. The key that unlocks the meaning of this seven sealed holy document is seen in what happens to Jeremiah the prophet. Let me set the stage here for what's happening in the 32nd chapter of <coughs> Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar is about to destroy Jerusalem. Jeremiah finds himself in prison. Not because he did anything wrong. He was doing everything right as a prophet of God. He was declaring the message. Babylon is coming. And there, he 
Hannah Meal uh, comes to Jeremiah with a strange request. He wants to sell some of his property to a kinsman redeemer, that being Jeremiah. His reasons were selfish, to say the least, because I think Hannah Meal realized that Jeremiah was right. Babylon was going to destroy Jerusalem. It was going to seize all the property. It was going to be worthless. Why don't I make a little money here before it's too late? So his reason for visiting Jeremiah in prison was not to encourage him and bless him. Here's Jeremiah. You got to appreciate this. His teeth are knocked out by river rocks by the jailers. He's strung up like a piece of meat in his cell and the sewers of Jerusalem because his cell was lowered to the uh, the lowest point in Jerusalem. The sewers flowed through his cell. The last thing on Jeremiah's mind is purchasing a, purchasing a piece of property. Come on. But Jeremiah that night realized that this is what God wanted him to do. In fact, God commanded him to do it. So he called Hanamiel back and said he would purchase the property. Seventy years, God's people were to be enslaved in captivity. Listen now, as the prophet imprisoned, suffering, finally agrees. Listen now as Jeremiah records the events. Then I knew this was the word of God. And I bought the field, and I signed the deed, and sealed it. And I gave the deed to Barak in the sight of Hanamiel, before all the Jews as witnesses that sat in the court of the prison. You'll find these events in Jeremiah 32, verses 8 through 12. I trust I haven't lost you yet. Because Jeremiah purchased the title deed to the land, and so has our Lord. So Barak, the priest, then took possession of the deed that was the legal documentation and proof of ownership. Until such a time in the future that Jeremiah or his heirs could come forward and open up the seal proving ownership. So what does this biblical account picture to us? A great deal. In the light of these historical events, we can once again return our thoughts to John's vision to the seven sealed scroll. Because it's here we can see Christ like Jeremiah of old coming forward, claiming the title deed of his creation, claiming the title deed by right of purchase, and claiming the title deed to the inheritance his father has left to him. This is what we're seeing here documented in the courtroom of heaven. And that's one great picture for us to contemplate. Because this title deed to which only he and he alone has the right to break the seven seals, opening up the deed to his entire kingdom. Because everything that is belongs to him. He created it. He purchased it. He bought it. He paid the price for it on the cross. And now he's inheriting it all. The king is taking possession of his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Here it is. 
Let's return our thoughts once more to verse number 6. And beheld, and lo. You see, John's excited, and he wants us to look at what he sees with the same sort of excitement. In the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, the four angelic beings, in the midst of the elders, those representing the priesthood stood before a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, and are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. The identity is the Lamb of God. Of course, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It's kind of interesting when you read the book of, Le uh, the book of Revelation. 28 times Jesus is referred to as a lamb in this book. John speaks to us about the wrath of the lamb in Revelation 6.16. John shows us the blood of the lamb in Revelation 7.14. And John states the bride of the lamb is indeed his church in Revelation 21 verse number 9. And that still makes your church relationship of vital importance. It should to you. Because it is to Jesus. And once again, we are inundated with a number of sevens. The Lamb's description of the seven horns pictures to us his perfect power. The Lamb's depiction having seven eyes portrays his all seeing presence. The Lamb comprising the seven spirits is the fulfillment and completion of the Holy Spirit's ministry in Christ. Man, is a great picture. Verse number seven. And he, Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Christ is the root coming from the lineage of David. And Christ is the lamb of God. Is pictured here coming forward. And he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. This is a dramatic scene in heaven. What's taking place here is uh, sh nothing short of wondrous in its significance. Where is Christ? He's no longer a babe in a manger, is he? He's not on the cross. As some religions still depict him. He's not left in the tomb. He's not in the grave. He's in the midst of heaven. And what's more, he is the center of all that transpires there. Love it. We're not going to be floating around in clouds with chubby little cherubs buzzing around our heads. Come on. The whole focus is the king. Verse number eight. And when he had taken the scroll, the book, the four living beings and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. I don't know about you, but I think this will be my posture when I see the king. And every one of them had harps and golden vials full of odors, incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I love God. He created music. And here we have uh, the priesthood with harps playing. And golden bowls full of sweet incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So when the weeping ends in verse number four for John, the praising begins in verse number eight in earnest. 
When the crying ends, the worship can begin. When the sorrow ends, the surrender. most certainly there. John sees the elders falling down before the Lamb and these golden vials. Gold in the Bible pictures something that is pure and priceless in the eyes of the Lamb who was slain. And now John identifies to us what the sweet incense contained in those golden vessels is. They symbolize the prayers of the saints. I'm glad on Wednesday night we're studying about praying and what our prayer lives uh, should look like. Christ values our prayers as gold. And he treasures them when they come before the throne they are sweet to him they represent our requests they characterize our cries to him they signify the value he places upon them and they embody his answers to us I think that's my uh, one regret when I first got saved is nobody sat down with me and said, Gary, let me share with you what a privilege it is to pray to God. Nobody taught me about prayer. I just kind of fumbled around uh, through it all, not really understanding the privilege the wondrous privilege, the awesome privilege of talking with God Almighty. You know what Jesus values, we should value? What he cherishes, we should cherish. What is sweet to him, should be sweet to us in what he loves. We are to love. I love worship. I love praising God. I love singing, even though most of my notes are flat and anybody that is around me will recognize that. Um, love it. I love worship in all of its facets. And I love the special moments I spend with my Father in heaven, just talking to him. And the psalmist sings, I love the Lord because he heard my cry. He heard my voice, my supplications. Psalms 116, verse number one. Is this you? Does this describe you? Because it certainly does me. Is this you? Because it most certainly is Christ. Those prayers to God are sweet to him. They should be sweet to us. The moments I spend with the Lord are so very sweet. Verse number nine. They sang a new song. I don't know about you, but I love new songs in worship. Last Sunday we sang the Revelation song and I've loved it. That's why I'm asking this of you, Tony. Uh, you taught us this song and it is beautiful. And I believe our Lord loves new songs too. Just listen. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Psalms 33, verse number 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear the Lord 
and shall trust in him. Psalms 40, verse number 3. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, and sing unto the Lord all the earth. Psalms 96, verse number 1. <laughs> oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. Psalms 98, verse number 1. Psalms 149, praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the saints. And later, even in Revelation, we will see 144,000 redeemed Jews in the tribulation singing a new song that no one else can. Now, I'm not going to be able to sing that song, but I can certainly listen to it. Amen. Find that in Revelation 14. And here before us in verse number 9 is a new Revelation song. And here are the lyrics. Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou hast slain and has redeemed us to God. The purchase price has been paid in full. And how was it? By the blood out of every kindred, family, tongue, people, and nation. How prized, how priceless, how precious is this blood that Jesus shed that Peter tells us about. And the lyrics of this new song continues in verse number 10. And hast, and you have made us, shaped us, molded us unto God, a kingdom of priests. The expression is kings and priests. But in the Greek, it comes out a kingdom of priests. And we shall reign on the earth. God bless your heart. We will with the king. And now the angels sing. Now the angels shout. Now the angels give praise to the king. In verse number 11. <coughs> and I beheld and heard the voice of many multitudes of angels round about the throne and the created beings and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand. The highest number that Greek mathematicians and Roman mathematicians could fathom in their mind was 10,000. Wow. And here we see 10,000 times 10,000. And if that's not enough, John then says, and thousands of thousands. So the number of angels here is incalculable. Here's what the angels in chorus are proclaiming. Saying with a loud voice. Again, a great voice, a mega voice. Worthy is the Lamb. Can you say that with your pastor? Worthy is the Lamb. Now can you say it with a mega voice? Worthy is the Lamb. <laughs> Payday, someday. <laughs> ah, love it. Worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power. Can you say it? To receive power. With a mega voice, to receive power. He deserves it. And riches.
and riches <laughs> and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. <laughs> now times that by 10,000. And then multiply that by another 10,000. And thousands of thousands. And it becomes millions upon millions. The heavens will resound with the praise, songs, and worship of the king. Whoa! What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Verse number 13. And every creature which is in heaven and upon the earth and under the earth and as such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say. I think that's interesting. We're, we're hearing millions of angels proclaiming these words. And all of a sudden, silence. And John speaks. Wow. Everybody hears what John is saying. Blessing and honor and glory and power beyond him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. For how long? God bless your heart forever. It is a long, long time. That is how long God will reign. That is how long the Lamb will rule. And that is how long we will reign with our King forever and ever. Even so come Lord Jesus. Verse number 14. And the four living beings said amen. Can you say amen with angels? Amen. <laughs> I'm, I'm squeaking it out of you, aren't I? <laughs> Can you say amen with the living beings around the throne? Amen. amen. <laughs> Can you say amen with your pastor to the great I am? Amen. amen. <laughs> and the four and twenty elders ruling with the king fell down. Let me tell you, when you fall down before your king, you're surrendered to him. You're surrendered to the king. And when you're surrendered to him, you can worship him. And with them, we will be able to do the same forever and ever. Amen. And they worshiped him forever and ever. Listen how Daniel, the, the prophet, describes this. And there was given unto him dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom shall never be destroyed. Daniel 7, 14. And listen to what John records later on in the Revelation. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And he shall reign forever and ever. You'll find that in Revelation 11. Uh, I 
in a couple weeks, we're going to start getting into some very heavy prophetic passages when judgment falls upon a sin-cursed world. And I love what John says at the conclusion of the book. He sees all these terrible things happening. And they are terrible. Terrible beyond the word terrible. And in the end of it all, he says, even so, come Lord Jesus, bring it on. Just, just let it come. <laughs> I love it. Going to be there with Jesus. He'll reign upon this earth for a thousand years, and then we'll go into eternity with him. What a day that will be. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. How great is our worship to the King? I can tell you it will be determined by the degree of your surrender to the Lamb. So how surrendered are you? And I love the privilege of worship granted us here in the lighthouse. And when you worship this Lord, you have learned the purpose for which you were created. This is it. Thank you, Lord. Love you, sweet people.